Good afternoon or good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us for today's Firehouse.com webcast titled First Arriving Operations, the Key to Success. Uh, today the presentation is being uh, given to you by Fire Chiefs Richard Pilatus and Thomas Richardson. We wanted to present this program to you to make sure that the proper steps are taken when you arrive, size up, and begin to control the fire so you get it before it gets out of control and injures any firefighters or residents. When we were trying to pick the program for Firehouse.com, these two veteran fire officers became the perfect match for us. Uh, they have both um, led companies and uh, their own firefighters through uh, fires in some of the toughest and busiest neighborhoods in New York City. Rich Blattis is a 32-year veteran of the fire service and is currently assigned to FDNY Rescue Battalion No. 1. He is a strong proponent of training and has served as both a regional and national instructor and lecturer for many fire service trade publications and has participated in numerous conferences, including hands-on training at Firehouse Expo. Tom Richardson is a battalion chief with the FDNY and is assigned to Battalion 38 in Brooklyn. With 32 years of service, he is a past chief instructor, or sorry, a past chief with the Deer Pork New York Volunteer Fire Department and an instructor for both the Suffolk County Fire Academy and the New York City Fire Academy. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor for the program, which is Streamlight. They'll try to pass our wisdom along to our children, but when your child follows you into a challenging profession, it's even more important to give them the tools they need to succeed and be safe. That's why the tradition of Streamlight flashlights have been passed along from generation to generation of heroes who depend on their lights to help save the day. And with Streamlight's newest innovations, like light beams for every kind of task, there's even more reasons for generations of heroes to trust Streamlight. You can learn more about Streamlight at Streamlight.com. During the presentation, we'd ask that you send any questions in for the presenters, and we'll take some time to answer them as we take a break towards the middle of the program and at the very end as well. Without any further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chiefs Richard Blattis and Thomas Richardson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everyone. Happy to be here with you today. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to use a modified size up process to walk you through the decision making process of the all important first arriving unit, whether it's a chief officer or the officer of the first arriving apparatus. Uh, your decisions in the first five minutes will have a significant impact on the tone and the outcome of the operation. Just remember as we go through the program to relate this all to the first arriving units. Try to tailor what we say and what we discuss to your response patterns for your department. Some of you may have a single apparatus that responds to a call for assistance. Some of you may have three and two in the larger city. So just keep in mind and tailor this to your first arriving units how you would like them to size up and operate. And once again, our initial focus is going to be the first five to ten minutes of the operation. Uh, a lot of it depends on the type of department that you're in and the response matrix or the response sequence. Um, that's going to decide and reflect on who is responding. Uh, are volunteers responding from home or do you have in-house crews? Are you a combination department with career firefighters supplemented by volunteers or on-call personnel? So how will who shows up affect the operation in the first five minutes? Uh, how long does it take to stretch lines and establish the water supply? Um, do you use pre-connects? Don't you use pre-connects? Uh, what's the location of the fire in your district? Um, and quite frankly, the location of the fire in the particular structure, that determines everything we do and the tactics that we implement, particularly in the first five to 10 minutes. And tie in the structure that you're responding to and the location of fire in the structure on the number of personnel you have responding to the scene. Your chief officer or your first officer in charge will have to make a quick determination if you're looking at a large factory building and you're having five firefighters on your initial response, on what tactics, if any, you can implement and how you're going to tailor your operational decision making to how many personnel you think you may need when you quickly assess the situation and start your initial attack. Before we get to the size up process and start walking you through, let's just talk a little bit about risk assessment and the all important risk versus reward dynamic and a little bit about situational awareness. awareness. Uh, so as it relates to risk assessment, before we even start the operation, we got to decide, 
Uh, what type of risk are we willing to take? Uh, are there occupants in the building? How do we know that there are or there aren't? Um, what if there are no reported occupants and all are accounted for? So what are you going to, how much of a risk are you, are you going to take? Um, we have to constantly be aware of where we are in relation to the fire. Um, you all have radios listening to the radio. Some departments, the smaller volunteer departments, don't have the luxury of everybody having a radio. So how do you know where you are in relation to the fire? Are you able to maintain constant situational awareness? And think about risk assessment and how we apply it in a fire service, and then think out of the box a little bit. A lot of us just responded to Hurricane Sandy, where we had severe street flooding, flash flooding, people trapped in basements that were flooding. So the point is, it's not always related to the fire response per se. We just had a very unique situation on the East Coast where we responded to structural fires and collapses, and we had that additional dynamic of flooding, and we had to make a decision whether we are going to put firefighters into moving water to rescue people that were in precarious situations. So just think out of the box a little bit and apply the risk assessment to everything we may look at in the fire service. It goes to structural firefighting, collapses, and every type of emergency we may need to address. And once again, reflecting on the first arriving unit operations, you have to make several decisions very quickly and many times with incomplete information. So depending on how many firefighters show up on the initial apparatus is going to really determine how much you're going to be able to do based on, on that risk assessment. So when does the risk assessment start? It starts from the receipt of the alarm. Um, in fact, it might start before receipt of the alarm based on the weather conditions in your particular response area, part of the country that you're in. Um, so again, that risk assessment, that reward, um, what type of alarm are we responding to? What's, what's, what did you get dispatched to? Did you get dispatched to a gas leak? Did you get dispatched to a structure fire? Did you get dispatched to a medical call? But once again, that really determines how you're going to respond. And what type of response are you going to? Uh, how do you receive your response information? Some may, may receive it via computer, some by voice alarm, some by phone. And if you have incomplete information, Try to obtain the information before you get out the door. Uh, it might be a quick call to the dispatcher on the radio to clarify something or to get additional information you may be looking for. Do you have any critical information? We call it SIDS in New York City. Is there anything in the computer system that's going to alert you to a particularly difficult situation in the building? So again, that all comes into the risk assessment process. And if you have incomplete information, strive to get as much information as you can before you get on the scene. For those of you that are volunteers out there across the country, um, many of the volunteers, in fact, where I come from on Long Island, we get dispatched via pagers, personal pagers, and I'm at home. And so we have to think about that whole risk assessment situation, responding to the fire station in our personal vehicles. So that's a whole other aspect of the risk assessment process. So when does the risk assessment end? We do a risk assessment when we get dispatched. We're doing a risk assessment as we're responding on the apparatus. We do another risk assessment when we arrive on the scene, and we're constantly reevaluating the risk versus the reward throughout the operation. Are we being successful? Does the chief have to change strategy based on the risk and what's going on with the fire situation? The risk assessment doesn't end until we get back to the firehouse safely on the apparatus. And when you do your reviews, when you get back to the firehouse and you do your drills, safety and the risk assessment should be part of the review process. Talk about things that happen on the fire ground, how you address them. Did you have enough members uh, to have a safety team in place when you needed them? And talk about things that would affect the safety on the fire ground. Did you get away with something? Was there any close calls on the fire ground? It's all part of the review process to make the risk assessment better for next time around. Some of the other issues that you need to relate to the risk assessment, you respond from multiple stations, whether it be volunteer or career. What is your response policy? Do you have a policy on certain types of runs you respond, what they call maybe on the quiet with no license sirens? Do you have a good seatbelt policy? 
Those are other additional items that you go into your risk assessment. One of the things that came out of risk assessment in the FDNY is uh, now that gas leaks are first units, the first engine and first truck respond in emergency road, uh, mode, excuse me, and the balance of the assignment comes into quiet mode. Uh, if they arrive on the scene and it's not a gas leak but a fire or any type of emergency, they can cancel the quiet mode and the other units boost up their speed. So we've successfully reduced accidents and incidents involving apparatus by, by responding to that risk assessment over time and changing the way that we respond. So that, that's helped us out in that area. In some parts of the city, the accident rate has been reduced somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 75 percent as a result of this new policy. And there are many departments across the country that have been doing this for years. It was a tough sell in the FDNY. I could tell you from my volunteer background, when we started a similar type of policy several years ago, it was a very tough sell in the volunteer fire department. So, um, but at the end of the day, it's going to keep our firefighters much safer, and we're acting in what we kind of believe is a more professional way. Now we're going to get into the size of process. We're going to start you off with talking about what is size of, what's the definition. So this is basically the definition of size of from many, many firefighter one texts that you might find across the country. Um, but we feel that this this particular definition might be an outdated approach. We need to enhance the size up process and the definition of size up. So size up, we want you to think of it as a dynamic process. It should be an ongoing evolution of all problems confronted. So again, it starts, uh, we're going to tell you with weather, it's going to start really early in the day, but it starts before you leave the firehouse. We want you to gather as much information as possible. We want you to think about the area you're responding to. What kind of buildings are in the area? Is it a factory area? Is it a private dwelling area? It's going to evolve through when you go out the door and you see the traffic patterns in the streets. And we want you to think about this, that size up is going to be every piece of information you gather, both before you leave to go to the fire scene, on the way to the fire scene, and when you get to the fire scene. It's, it's a continual process, and so we want your mindset to change from the old definition of what it used to be to this ever-evolving process with all the new dynamics that have come into the fire service. So as you see on the slide there, we're showing fire size up starts with the receipt of the alarm, continues until all units have left the scene. But really, when does it really start? It starts well before the alarm. In a volunteer system, I would suggest and I would argue that the size up process is going on every day you drive around your fire district. Um, we talk about windshield size of when we're talking about our communities that we live in as volunteers, we're doing that size of constantly, what's going on in our, in our particular district. Are they, are they, are they building new career, new, new, uh, new projects in your district? And, and being much aware in the career service, when we go to work, we're driving to work. We're listening maybe to the weather report, or you listen to the forecast prior to going to work, and you know, hey, it's going to be a windy night tonight. That might be something I might have to deal with when I go to a structure fire or other type of an emergency. So here's our suggested modified 14 points of size up. This came from a very senior fire deputy chief that we both used to work with. Um, he kind of put it in a priority order. So if you take a look at it, the first two items on that size of process are probably the most important. What time of day do we receive the alarm? What's the life hazard right off the bat? And if you look further down the line in the 14 points of size up, three, four, five, and six are all about the building the height of the building, how big is the building, what's the construction, what's the occupancy. So that's our next priority. We get to the building, we did our size up, we got that information. The next piece of information that we're looking for relative to a structure fire, where is the fire in the building? Where is it, where is it going? Do we have an exposure problem? So we have time of day life hazard, building information, fire information. 
From there, we have to look at what our resources are going to be and what's the environment. What is our apparatus response? What are the manpower on our apparatus? How many people do we have in those initial five to ten minutes? Can we establish a water supply? Do we have hydrants? Are we in a rural area where we use tanker, tanker shuttles? Do we have auxiliary fire protection, stamp pipes or sprinklers in the building? The weather and the wind conditions and obviously the street conditions determine apparatus placement, uh, access to a fire area, depending on where you come from. And for the purposes of today's presentation, again, take this definition of size up and then apply it to your first arriving units. Take the first bracket of the first priority of time of day in life and then take your resources bracket. Those are the two things that you can control. Uh, the life hazard you can limit by your resources and do you have enough resources to address the situation that you're responding to. So this breaks it down in a little simpler form. You don't have to remember every particular item in the bracket, but it breaks it down to the four things that are really important for first arriving units and it breaks it down for the incident commander. Do you have enough personnel and enough resources to address those priorities as they're listed? So now we're going to take you one step at a time through the, through the, uh, the size of process, and we're going to start with the time of day. So the size of is going to change a bit depending on the time of day and the type of occupancy reported. What does the time of day do to your preparedness or your mindset? Is it a daytime response with volunteers? Do we have to rely on automatic mutual aid to get the required number of people to the fire scene? If we're in a career department, what is the staffing issues on your apparatus? Are we going to have difficulty stretching a line in a multi-story building with limited staffing? These are things you need to think about. At the time, of, uh, at night, we're going to expect in a residential building that we're going to have a life hazard. During the day, we can't rule the life hazard out, but we always have to be mindful of that. Um, in, in the volunteer setting, time of day is big, particularly during the day, during the week. And how does the time of day impact on your traffic and your response patterns, especially in a volunteer setting? Time of day, not only personnel is difficult, people are working, but what about uh, if you live in a very heavily populated area in a city and it's volunteer response, what about getting the firefighters to the operation? Is it going to take them an extraordinary amount of time due to traffic concerns, construction, et cetera. And certainly if you're responding to a commercial building during the day or a commercial building at a time of day when traffic is an issue, is that going to require us to be mindful of what's going on with the fire if our response is delayed in any way? As far as the life hazard is concerned, you could see that at night sometimes we do have people working in buildings. In fact, in many of the uh, poorer neighborhoods in New York City, a lot of the small business owners actually live in commercial occupancies and they're locked in there at night. So that's something that we have to contend with sometimes depending on uh, what time the fire is reported. So let's talk about the life hazard. Just a point of information, the last 20 line of duty deaths in the FDNY, there were no civilians killed and no civilians injured at those particular fires. That is a staggering statistic. So with that being said, when do we take risk? Certainly the life hazard is the most serious factor in our size up, but once again, if there's no life hazard, what should be our priority? We are the number one life hazard. In our view, absent the life hazard, the number one priority is to get water on the fire stretch a hose line. Are there buildings or occupancies you're responding to where the life hazard is going to be increased? Absolutely. But again, keep in mind, keeping our firefighters safe is our number one priority. If we can't keep our firefighters safe, we can't address any other life hazard or perform any rescues. Okay. We have to address known life hazards. And if we go back to our standards, if we talk about two in and two out, OSHA requirements say that we're going to operate in teams all of the time. However, if there is a known life hazard and manpower is at a premium, we can carry out a rescue operation individually if we know there is a life hazard. But there has to be good information 
confirmed information that we do have the life hazard. The first arriving unit sometimes has their hands full if we have a life hazard on arrival. Sometimes we have to make decisions. Do we address the life hazard? Do we address the fire? Uh, we would recommend that you have to try and do it simultaneously, but at all costs, we want to make sure that we're stretching a line to protect not only the civilians or civilian that we're trying to rescue, but out of the firefighters that are going to attempt the rescue operation. Also remember, if we have one victim or more, how many firefighters does it take? How many firefighters does it take to remove a, a victim from a fire? Just say for argument's sake, looking at the picture in the slide, we had a person trapped on a second floor on arrival. We have a driver, officer, and two firefighters in the back of the apparatus. So if we had to get a portable ladder up to that person, how many people is it going to take? Can one person put the ladder up while the others are stretching the line? Once we get the ladder up, if the person is conscious and alert, they might be able to help themselves out, but if in fact they go unconscious and we have to enter to remove them, how is that going to impact on, on our operation? We have to remember, we have to get water on the fire because that might save more lives than anything. In fact, there might be one person at the window, there might be three more people in the building that if we put the fire out, we wind up saving their lives as well. I'd like you to key in on, on that very important point that Tom just mentioned about stretching the line and getting water on the fire. Uh, we all, uh, the fire service has gotten very good at disseminating information. Uh, we all see on various websites and through various emails the firefighters that are tragically killed and heroic efforts to save civilians or to search houses in remote areas of the country that are on fire, often with tragic results. Most of the time when you see firefighters killed, in the line of duty in that situation, they arrived on the scene first. There was no engine company on the scene. It's a, it's a pretty well-involved dwelling, frame dwelling, and the firefighter is making a valiant effort to search, and a lot of times it's in vain. So just remember that we're, we're making risk versus reward decisions. Having that hose line in position greatly reduces our, our risk. Uh, it's, it's a very important tactic and something that we really, really have to think about when we make these decisions to enter these structures with limited personnel on the scene, with no water on the scene, it's a very, very difficult decision. You have to really think about it, and you have 10 seconds to think about it. You really have to review a lot of the things we're speaking at and try to make a, the best decision you can for the risk that you're going to take on the fire ground. Another consideration with a known life hazard, once we do remove the person from the environment, do you have EMS on the scene? Are they on the scene? Are they coming? Where do you get them from? What is the policy in your particular department? Just remember that we're going to need EMS and the incident command is going to need to call for them if they're not en route. The and bottom line, go ahead, I was just going to say, just to reinforce, the bottom line was uh, get a hose line between the civilians and the fire. That's the best way to protect life, best way to protect your firefighters get the staffing you need on the scene, get the line of position. Okay, we're going to start talking about our next priority sequence in the size of the process. We're going to talk about the building. We get on the scene, we arrive on the scene, we assess our life hazard. Now we're going to talk about the building itself. So, the height of the building, what does that do to our decision-making process early in the operation? If we roll up with the first arriving apparatus, are we going to be in need of ladders, or are we just going to devote ourselves to stretching a hose line? Even stretching a hose line, where is the fire located in the building? If we're talking about a private dwelling, two, two and a half stories, probably height is not a big issue. However, if we're talking about a multi-story building, height does become an issue relative to all of our firefighting tactics, uh, in particular stretching a hose line. Do we have enough people to get the fire where it needs to go? And again, just like having enough resources to stretch a hand line, do you have enough resources to adequately ladder the building? Think about a large building in your neighborhood or in your response area, and think about how much personnel you'd need to adequately ladder that building to keep the civilians safe and to keep the firefighters safe. So what is your department policy on laddering? Who does it? When do they do it? Does your department have a policy for vent and to search with portable ladders? Uh, 
Do you have an aerial device? And if you do, do you get it in the front of the building? When you get a RIT team, rapid intervention team on the scene, do they place additional ladders? Does command advise the interior crews where the ladders are once we get ladders in position? So in the event firefighters have to egress, they can. And just uh, try to remember when it comes to laddering, try to use the ladders also if you're in a commercial building to define the limits of the fire, define, define the firewalls in your building. So not only think of ladders as addressing the height issue, but use them to address some of the other size up issues on the fire ground. Uh, it's good for the incident command. to stand out in front of a commercial building and see two ladders on either side, on the two and four side, and it'll define the limits of the firewalls in that particular occupancy. It's a good visual aid, and it's something else we could do with the ladders to help out uh, with the firefighting tactics. So we're going to move into area, and when we talk about different dwellings, 
Think about the area. What does the size up of the building influence for you? It certainly has to influence how many firefighters you have responding. If you have a small one-story bungalow-type private dwelling, do you need as many firefighters in that situation as a 200 by 200 factory? Uh, not only will you need an abundance of firefighters to uh, search the factory, it'll, get, it'll be involved. You'll need search lines. How many firefighters will you need to stretch the lines in that large area search? What about RIT teams? If you're in a large area building, will you need additional RIT teams? Will you need one on the front side, one on the back side? And again, what about the fire involvement in the area? If it's a large area building, you have heavy smoke condition that's going to preclude your search. Think about how this impacts on the ability of the first arriving units to address this situation, and think about how the IC will have to make operational and tactical decisions based on the size of this building. It changes the whole dynamic of your operation. Next will be construction. Probably in the last 25 to 30 years, nothing has impacted the fire ground more than building construction and the new lightweight building construction. Um, in particular as it relates to new or renovated buildings. As far as the building construction is concerned, how does that impact your decision making for the first arriving unit? Well, do you realize or do you know how fire spreads in different types of construction? In non-fireproof construction, brick and joist construction, usually vertical voids within the walls allow fire extension from floor to floor. Alterations introduce new larger voids, particularly in lightweight construction. Be aware of fire travel in relation to where you stretch your hose line and where you send your search crews. This is certainly a major contributing factor in many firefighter fatalities in the last several years. And you know coming out in the fire service, we've been talking about it for a few years now, but the energy efficient windows, the hurricane windows, et cetera, how they're impacting on our ability to implement our tactics. So construction not only deals with the, the wood and, and the guts of the building, it's also the windows and the surrounding membranes that also impact us. And we've also, uh, in the fire service, we've talked about the different roofing now over the past few years, how gypsum roof, how membrane roof has also impacted on our operation. So we have a lot to deal with out there, and what it's making us do is really do a good job on size up, really do a good job on slowing down and making our tactical decisions based on a lot more information than we used to have in the past. When we're talking about searching, particularly above a fire, if we decide early in an operation in that first five to ten minutes that we're going to deploy search teams above the fire based on our life hazard evaluation, um, we have to be cognizant of the type of construction we're dealing with. The degree of danger or the threat of being trapped above a fire is greatly influenced by the construction of the burning building. Vertical fire spread is more rapid in wood frame construction. Searching above the fire in wood frame buildings is extremely dangerous. Um, the incident commander, it might be the first arriving officer, needs to be very, very aware of what members are operating remote from the fire area. Where are those search teams and do we have communication to keep them abreast of what's going on? Do they have radios? What about in the morning when you're sizing up early in the day and the incident commander, the company officer, the chief officer looks at their riding lists and evaluates the level of experience of the crew that's on duty that day? Are you going to take a relatively young, new to the fire service, inexperienced crew and put them in a very precarious, above the fire search uh, situation? Or are you going to take your more experienced crew People have been around a while. People have gone to a lot of operations and used them in that situation. So again, not only the construction of the building and how it impacts on the safety of the firefighter, but when you get into the most dangerous types of construction, the most dangerous situation, you're going to use the ability of your crews and your size up in the morning based on their experience when you make a decision about who to send where. In the past 30 years, over 16 FDNY firefighters have been killed while operating above a fire very dangerous position. Above the fire floor in non-combustible or limited combustible construction presents its own hazard when we're talking about C joists or open web steel bar joist construction or lightweight wood construction. As it relates to construction, we have to be able to identify it hopefully well before the fire. 
So how does that happen in your particular fire district, in your response area? How do you identify new construction? Do you drill when you do identify new building, buildings with, new, with, uh, with uh, lightweight construction or any new construction that's going on? It doesn't have to be lightweight. What are your relationships with your local building department officials? Do you get information on new construction? In the city of New York now, we have a very good relationship with our building department. Our local units get notified anytime there's new construction, and we are required to go out and inspect buildings that are certain size in certain area. Um, do you conduct windshield size up every time you're going to work or every time you're at work driving around in the apparatus? You have to know your district. As it relates to the volunteer fire service, in our view, there is no excuse for volunteers not knowing their district. We realize that some volunteer fire districts are very large, um, but some are not. You should know your district. I happen to live in the town that I grew up in, so I kind of know my fire district like the back of my hand. You have cameras on the apparatus. Everybody's got a smartphone today. All the young firefighters have smartphones. They carry them with them all the time. Take pictures while you're driving around and use it for drill when we do identify new construction in the area. In fact, that's a good drill or a good task for your new firefighters. Uh, tell them, listen, when you're walking around town, if you see something that you think might be a, grill to a good drill topic for us or some construction feature that piques your interest, take out your smartphone, take some pictures, bring it back to the firehouse, let's talk about it. Uh, you know, where we live in this city, there's, there's, I can't walk two blocks without seeing something that piques my interest with regard to construction or a new type of construction that's going to be dangerous to our firefighters. So great task for a new firefighter. Get them involved in a profession. Uh, give them something to do that's interesting to them, and it's going to go a long way. So here's an example of a fire in a building with lightweight wood trusses. Did we know about this prior? Would that be helpful relative to our search? This is in the middle of a room where they had a floor collapse. Essentially, a piece of carpet was uh, supporting the firefighters. So you need to find out before you have the fire when you have this type of construction. So can you tell from the exterior? You roll up to this. Can you tell from the exterior? So looking at this photo and some of the things we talked about with regard to construction, what type of construction do you think this is? Uh, do you think there's thermopane windows? Do you think there are difficulties that are going to impact on a firefighter? This is something you can easily pick up driving by this location, taking some pictures, going in there, looking around, and it will save our life. This particular structure has floor trusses, floor lofts. Would you know that from the exterior? It could, you could have them. It could not have them. Firefighters will die operating above the flyer with this type of construction. We're very reactive in the fire service. We really haven't talked about truss construction in floors until maybe the past two or three years. And that's a response to firefighters dying in this type of occupancy. So again, what would you want to know? If you don't have the answers, go out and find out. These are all over the place. Go out on drill. Go take a look around. Go to your building department. Let them give you the addresses where this type of construction is going up. In the last several years, if you read any of the firefighter fatality reports from NIOSH, we've had several firefighters going through the door and through the floor, as they say. So this is critical information that you need to gather well before the alarm. All right, guys, so thank you very much uh, for the first half of the presentation. Again, if you do have any questions for um, Tom or Rich, please send them in, and we'll uh, start addressing them here in just a moment. And uh, if we don't get to them now, we'll get to them for sure at the very end. Uh, before we get to the questions, again, I just want to thank Streamlight for sponsoring today's uh, webcast uh, for us. A lot of people depend on their flashlights to do a good job, but for some, those lights have, are even more critical. Some use Streamlight survivors for search and rescue missions, Others select Streamlight tactical lights and laser sighting devices to help them defuse some dangerous situations. And no matter what you do, there's a Streamlight flashlight that'll help you do it better and safer. Heroes trust Streamlight. Okay, guys, uh, we'll get to the first question here. Um, and it says, uh, Chief Salk has said in a Firehouse Magazine recent article recently not to use the term nothing showing. 
uh, on an approach report. Uh, he doesn't go on to say what he recommends. Uh, what do you guys recommend? We happen to agree with Chief Salka. I'm not a big proponent of nothing showing, uh, in particular because many, many times you can pull up to a, a, it could be a dwelling fire, and because of the construction today, thermal pane windows and the tightness of buildings, you can have a serious fire going on, and there might be nothing showing on the outside. If you use the term nothing showing, what that does to all the other responders, it kind of gets them into a different mode and it slows them down. So that's why we don't recommend it. So I think what I would recommend is that you get on the scene, you're on scene, and you're doing an investigation until further orders. You know, and that's how I would kind of use the term. That's exactly the term I would use. I would let the dispatcher know I'm on scene, we're proceeding with our investigation. That, that's a good way to, to characterize what's going on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Next question uh, comes and it says, uh, generally speaking, do you guys feel that the impact of a membrane roof and its effects on operations is understated? Uh, I think it is understated. It's another new facet of construction in the fire service that we do not have a lot of experience with. Uh, it does pose unique difficulties for us. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the issues is that the young firefighters and, and a good deal of the firefighters, in fact, are not really familiar with the membrane roof and the impacts that it has on firefighting. Uh, it's just like truss roof. It took us a long time to adequately adapt and operate safely on truss roofs, and I think the impacts of membrane roof, uh, it will take a while for us to, to get uh, a tight grasp on that. The only thing I would add to that is that the membrane roofs, unless the membrane roof is involved in the fire, um, typically it doesn't become a big factor. If we have the membrane roof actually involved in fire, then that's a whole other aspect of the fire. We have to be talking about pulling the underside of the roof rather than operating on the top. And that comes directly from Frank Brannigan, if you read his book, uh, Building Construction for the Fire Service. He says with membrane roofs, basically if you get a fire involved in a membrane roof, it's, it's, uh, going, to, it's going to travel very quickly, and the only viable tactic is to cool the underside of the roof to prevent the off-gassing of the membrane roof. But unless the roof is actually involved in fire, the membrane roof hopefully is not a big factor early on. Well, as long as we recognize it. As long as uh, we recognize we it. We've got to have the young fire. firefighter recognize what they're on. Okay. And uh, tagging on the building construction, another question here it says, uh, or comes in, it says, in ordinary construction buildings, how does having metal stud walls differ from a wood stud wall? It's funny that you asked that question. I recently had a fire in a building that was all metal studs and heavy C joists as the roof and floor supports. And we had a very advanced fire on arrival, a fire spreading to several buildings uh, that were attached uh, basically on auto exposure on the rear of the building because they had vinyl siding on the outside. However, related to the metal studs, um, it didn't really impact on the fire. I was very, very surprised that with the amount of fire that we had, that we did not have any failure of the metal studs or the sea joists or the metal flooring because we had good sheetrock. We had a tremendous amount of blown-in insulation, basically insulating the sea joists and the wood or the metal studded walls, and the fire did not penetrate the sheetrock and really we didn't have any structural issues. So I was very surprised. Um, so I don't think it, the, the metal studs really has a tremendous impact on, on, a, on a firefighting operation, uh, uh, at least initially. If the fire does enter the walls and starts to affect the structural stability of the studding, then it's a different story. Yeah, that was going to be my point. I think in the initial operations, Tom's right on the money. It's not going to have much of an impact. If you have a severely advanced fire and it's getting into the walls, then you're going to have to start to have additional considerations. But again, probably by that point, if the fire is that advanced, you're starting to talk about withdrawing from the building. So I think initially it's not an issue. Excellent, guys. Thank you. Two questions here from uh, Hank, and I'll put them up here just as soon as I read them. Uh, the first is uh, looking for your thoughts on the recent NIST study 
uh, a ventilation keeping the um, the doors closed behind you. Um, the second is what are your thoughts of hitting a vented fire from the outside first and then going in uh, in relation to the high temperatures of the plastics that are found in two days uh, structures and I'll just push that up so you can see it. Well, we're, I think we're all in the beginning stages of this learning curve relative to the new phenomenon of the ventilation, uh, change in ventilation tactics. In fact, in the SDNY, we're just going to be starting a new training program for all battalion chiefs. We just rewrote our ventilation bulletin based on the NIST studies. We got a couple of guys from our job that were very intricately, intricately involved in the process. So what, what I would suggest is that the science is the science. It, it definitely tells the story. We definitely should be paying attention to it. I would suggest that anybody in the fire service um, that's into the job, particularly officers and chief officers, you should go to the UL website, the NIST websites, and take a look at the videos and learn from them. Um, what I've learned is that there is no question about the fact that because of the content, so maybe to add, add, answer the second part of the question, the contents have changed. There's no question the construction has changed. We already talked about that. The smoke from the fire that's generated by the contents burning, the smoke is fuel. And the research is telling us that when we add ventilation, when we perform ventilation, we are giving a basically an oxygen-starved, heated environment what it needs to burn explosively. And what I've learned so far is that when the fire goes to the decay stage, and then we introduce venting, whether it be opening doors or windows, we're giving it that oxygen. And if you look at the curves in the scientific graphs, we do have an explosive, um, an explosive increase in, in how the fire progresses. Yeah, and remember, you know, the, the two key things again: the, the fire is the, the, the new plastics. The fire is starving for oxygen, and what we're trying to do is interrupt the flow path. So by keeping the door closed with the members inside, we're interrupting the flow path. We're preventing that fire from exploding and going toward the source of oxygen, which is the open door. So that's one facet of the operation. But remember, if you put a hose line in position, you can open the door and the members are inside. Obviously, that's, you're interrupting the flow path with the hose line, with the hand line. So uh, I know this, it's a very hot topic in the fire service, but there is a lot of misinformation out there. And it's really all about the flow path and that explosive oxygen, uh, explosive fire looking for the oxygen. So what we're trying to do is interrupt that flow path by either keeping the door closed or by getting a hairline in position by either tactic. What I would add to that is that something else that we're learning is that the scientists are telling us that once we do create that flow path by opening the door or opening the window, we have probably 60 to 90 seconds to operate and get water on the seat of the fire. So keep that in mind. As far as hitting a vented fire from the outside, this is a topic of a highly heated discussion. However, again, when you look at the science, it has always been felt by many in the fire service, especially some of us that are older, that we push fire with hose lines when we operate hose lines from the outside. This science is suggesting that we may not be doing that. However, we are cooling the environment in even remote areas by operating the line from the outside. So I think that's an individual department decision, and I don't think anybody can tell you what to do. You're on a scene. You're the first arriving unit on a scene. You have to make that decision. But I would suggest that go look at the research and get the information so that you can make an educated decision on that stuff. Absolutely. Who's, who's old? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, last question, uh, going back to the membrane roof, and then we'll uh, we'll get into the uh, second half of the presentation. Uh, asking, uh, do you advise venting a membrane roof or venting horizontally uh, when possible? Typically, when you have a membrane roof, you usually have lightweight uh, steel bar joist construction in many 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 situations, or you have uh, gypsum roofs, a composite, it's like a gypsum composite material, concrete and, and, and uh, gypsum together. So we don't really recommend 
venting and membrane roof vertically, and we do recommend if there are windows high up on the walls in those types of occupancies that you can use those. And typically, they actually are providing vertical ventilation because you usually find those windows high uh, in the occupancy. And remember, like Tom said before, it's coupled with the hose line underneath cooling it down. If you can't, you know, get the hose line in place, then, it, then it's all pretty much moved whether you bent or not. Now, one other issue just quickly with membrane roofs, if we have a smoldering fire on a membrane roof and we can safely operate, we may have to put firefighters to just cut the membrane roof into sections to remove it in order to get full extinguishment. Mm -hmm. So that's something to think about. Yeah. And I did lie a little bit because a couple more questions just came in, and it's actually a, a great question because uh, the house I purchased just about a year ago, uh, it has one. Um, any input or information on metal roofs, um, ventilation, um, uh, any, anything that you know you can do? They sound great with the rain coming down at night, I know that, uh, but beyond that, uh, um, do you have any tips for working with metal roofs? What I would say is if you're talking about dwellings, most of the time we're talking about peak roofs to begin with. Yeah. And okay. our recommendation, anytime you have a peak roof, if you're going to cut a peak roof, is usually the most safely done from an aerial platform, our ladder. Uh, if you don't have a towel ladder, then we recommend an aerial device of some sort. However, tactically, what we found from our experience is that venting a peaked roof very often, um, because of how long it takes to do it, whether it's a wood roof or a metal roof, probably a metal roof takes longer, um, does it really do much for you early in the operation? It's usually a tactic that's done late, that tactic that's done later in the operation. So I wouldn't get involved in probably cutting, particularly if it's a peak roof. Uh, flat metal roofs, again, we're probably talking about lightweight construction components supporting it. So we probably would not get involved in that if you had a fire of serious enough consequence that required that type of cutting. And remember, even with a peak roof, if you're going to elect to take on that task from an aerial platform, et cetera, uh, once you vent that roof, you're just venting the attic. But that's only phase one of the operation. You still have to get in there and push the ceiling down to actually vent the fire area. So, again, it's going to add even more time to that tactic, which is why it makes that, that decision uh, a difficult one. All right, guys, thank you. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead with the second half of the presentation. And, again, if you do have any questions uh, for the presenters, please go ahead and send them in, and we will get to those as we wrap up the program. Okay. So we're going to move on now. We're going to finish up the building. We did the height, area, and construction, and now we're talking about the occupancy of the, of the uh, structure. Certainly on initial dispatch, you should have an idea of the occupancy that you're going to, or if not, if you're just getting an intersection for a reported fire or an emergency, what types of buildings are in that particular part of your district. So you might have some general information. But once you arrive on the scene, Again, the occupancy is going to determine your life hazard. Um, it may determine the severity of the fire. It may help you determine the construction of the building. Um, and quite, quite frankly, uh, how the fire is going to travel or extend in that building. Again, knowing your district, knowing your response area, uh, because the occupancy has a tremendous impact on the life hazard and the manpower deployment. If we're talking about a dwelling, we need less people. If we're talking about a large area of commercial structure, we're going to need more people. So occupancy is critical. Do you have hazardous materials stored in the building? Do we know that ahead of time? Is that part of your computer dispatch information? If you have computer-aided dispatch, if you don't have computer-aided dispatch, do you have a mechanism to identify that type of information early? How about what just happened recently in West Texas? The uh, anhydrous ammonia explosion in that small community. That occupancy was there for many, many years. They actually built the community around that commercial structure because that's where all the jobs were. But I'm sure the firefighters were well aware of what was going on in that building. They probably had responded there several times. So occupancy is critical. You know, and and to for another term or to add on to occupancy, the use of the facility. So like Tom is saying in West Texas, uh, it's, it's a gas refinery or a gas storage facility. Uh, something you know early on when you get that response in your firehouse, 
Uh, we talk about in a lot of our lectures about having a card file if you don't have a computerized uh, critical information system. So you have a card file by address, you get that response, you pull the card, you see what uh, dangers are in that occupancy, you see what kind of use facility it is, and again, it helps you with early decision making and your size up for your first arriving units. You know that in some occupancies in your district, you, you're going to need a greater or a second alarm assignment right off the bat if you have any time of any type of verified incident there. So it gets you thinking early and it helps you with the your decision making process. So here's a private dwelling. Hey, let's just take a look at this. Here's a fire that originated in the basement. Take a look at the smoke. This is what we're dealing with today many times on arrival. That that black swirling, heavy thick smoke due to the type of fuel that we're talking about today. So one of the questions was all about ventilation and the new research, UL, NIST, uh, fuel, oxygen, ventilation, and the flow path. At this particular fire, we had a floor collapse. We had a firefighter bail out the first floor window um, as a result of the advancing fire. So although it's a small little dwelling fire, and we're well aware of the occupancy and the dangers that we can um, encounter, uh, these can be very serious fires, and in fact, we all know most firefighters that die in fires are dying in residential buildings, particularly private dwellings, as well as civilians. And, and just uh, to relate to the question that, that the uh, firefighter sent in about nothing showing in John's article, uh, think about pulling up to this fire and giving a report of a uh, heavy fire on the first floor. In this fire, it's actually a basement fire. So not that that's uh, totally incorrect, you may have extension to the first floor, but you're getting the responding firefighters in a mindset that they're going to a first floor fire when in fact it's a basement fire and your operational tactics and some of your decision making is going to change. So just remember, like anything you put over the air, you want it to be as accurate as possible. You want to give the incoming firefighters an accurate and uh, an as accurate picture as possible when they're coming in to help them get in the mindset of what they're going to be doing and how they're going to operate. So we go to a multiple dwelling fire, multi-story building. Do you have aerial devices? Are aerial devices required? You're going to have multiple life hazards here. Uh, you have multiple types, multiple floors, multiple apartments. What are the fire spread hazards related to the construction of a particular multiple dwelling? We're going to need more manpower, both for extinguishment as well as searches. If we have a fire on the lower floor, we're going to have those floor above hazards that we talked about earlier. We're going to need multiple hose lines maybe. And certainly when we're stretching hose lines in a multiple dwelling or a multi-story building, we have to start to think about stairway management. That always becomes an issue at every fire. And the amount of manpower staffing you're going to use for this operation. And look on to the right side of the screen with the awning where the entrance is. How complex is that hand line stretch going to be? How much staffing are you going to need? to get it where it needs to go. And to give initial reports, uh, you may say that we have heavy fire on the top floor when in fact this is a roof fire. Uh, the roof is on fire. You can see in the front on the top floor we have nothing showing. So again, careful size up, careful the way you describe the situation, and a good read on how much staffing you're going to need to address an operation in a building this size. If we're talking about a vacant building or an unoccupied building, we certainly have to think about slowing down our operation, being a little more deliberate about our initial size up? Do we know about this information ahead of time? Do we know that this particular dwelling or this occupancy was vacant? Is it a vacant residential building? Is it a vacant commercial building? So you still have all of the associated hazards with those particular occupancies. If we're going to get into large caliber stream operations, what are we doing if we initial initially started an interior operation. How do we transition from interior to exterior? All of those things come into play when we're talking about vacant building or unoccupied building fires. And what about marking your vacant buildings? Again, going out there, being proactive. Uh, we have a marking system in the city of New York which tells us whether we want to enter or stay out of vacant buildings based on the condition of the building, etc. What about doing that in your community? Go out there if you have vacant structures or dilapidated structures. Come up with a marking system. You know what? We'll mark this building. We're not going in there. There's nothing in there. It's not worth our risk. We're going to keep firefighters out. So another way you can proactively address the situation and keep your firefighters safe. 
We're talking about commercial occupancies. We talked about do they have hazardous materials. The big thing with commercial occupancies versus a residential fire, what is the life hazard? The time of day will probably determine what your life hazard is, whether it's a, a, a commercial strip mall or is it an industrial building. Again, depending on the time of day, that's not to say that overnight hours that we don't have people in these types of buildings. So again, doing that initial size up and hopefully having a lot of information prior to the incident or prior to the response, you'll be able to make some initial calls as the first arriving unit. And remember, we talked a lot about firefighter safety. Now remember, hazardous occupancy, commercial occupancy at night, uh, if you verify there's no workers inside there and it's a pretty decent sizable fire in a complex layout, all these people have lots of insurance. Let's not put our firefighters at risk trying to save a commercial building, trying to save a McDonald's, et cetera, where they're going to rebuild it tomorrow and not have a second thought about what happened the night before. Let's make really good, safe, conscious decisions on how we address fires in these occupancies. Now we're going to talk about the fire. We talked about the building. Now let's talk about the fire. Location, location, location probably the most important component of the size of process because it's going to determine how much of the building has to be searched, how much fire do I have, how many lines do I need. Every decision that we make relative to tactics is going to depend on the location and the extent of the fire. No question, no, no, no question at all. Absolutely. The what and where of the fire. Where is it? What do I have? Where is it in the building? What do I have? It's all going to be very important information for you. Let's take a look <clears throat> at this picture. We have a dwelling fire. We have, I would, I would ask some of these questions if I was using this picture as a drill. Where is the fire? So we can see visible fire on the first floor showing out a first floor window. But say that fire wasn't showing out the window and we got it and we, there was really nothing going on in the first floor from the exterior and we had the heavy smoke condition out of the third floor windows, basically that's the third floor. Could we get sucked into deploying our resources early right to the third floor and then find out, come to find out later that the fire is below us? This happens very, very often. So doing that complete size up. What's the construction of this building? This is an older dwelling, probably balloon frame construction. Need to take that into consideration. The fire may have started in the basement or the cellar. Where do you stretch the first line? All of these questions come up. They should come up in the initial size of process. Then you do the 360 survey, 360 degrees, get around the entire building. If you're the initial incident commander, the initial arriving company officer, you certainly want to do that 360 survey. Um, is there a rear entrance? Is there access in the rear? What's going on in the rear? There might be a heavy fire condition in the rear. Do I need portable ladders? Do I have an aerial device? to help us with some ventilation or for access. And again, tie this all into that early size up slide into those four categories. The life, time of day was the first priority, your building, where the fire is, and your resources. Let's tie that all together. Like Tom just said, all the items you just went down on your checklist, tie it into that size up for your first arriving units. It's really going to help you make good tactical decisions. Next thing about the fire, we locate it, we find out where it's going, do I have an exposure problem? Are exposures an initial problem for us when we first arrive? If we have fire in more than one building, we definitely need to think about additional manpower. So again, the first arriving officer or the first arriving unit has to make that determination. Do you have enough manpower to address an exposure problem on arrival? And what if you don't? How do you get your help? You all have policies for calling mutual aid in your various fire districts and fire response areas. Those of us in the career sector, we have transmit additional alarms, we request additional units. The other issue is exposures. Once we get into exposure problems, whether they're attached buildings or detached buildings, we have to start thinking about sectoring the operation. So that initial arriving officer might have to start delegating some of the responsibility to other chiefs or other officers in order to maintain a manageable span of control. Remember, exposures can be interior exposures as well. We have a lower floor fire and we have a couple of floors above. Those are interior exposures. 
when you come into building exposures and you want to gather as much information as possible as incident commander, if you can't get it from the units operating on the inside and you can't do your 360 because you're tied up, use somebody else that's on the scene. Grab a company that's, in, uh, that's standing by. Let the officer send someone to do a 360 for you. If you're fortunate enough to have a battalion firefighter, send them around the back. Let them do the 360 for you. Gather as much information as your exposures as you possibly can so you make the best decision you can. So how does fire travel to the exposures? We said we can have interior exposures. In some buildings, attached buildings, we might have fires that, sh that jump across shafts, interior shafts, window to window. Exposures are going to require additional hose lines. Do you have the manpower to do that? Do we have the manpower or do we have the resources relative to apparatus to place apparatus in front of exposure, particularly laddering apparatus? And certainly, are we going to have enough manpower to handle this exposure problem on arrival? Now, if you look at this picture and you see the, uh, the idiot chief officer out front, that's me. Uh, I had this fire, okay, this is in the Bronx in a row frame building. So if we go down that size up column, my priority life uh, and time of day, there was nobody in the building. We verified there was nobody in the building. I have a wood frame building, okay, but one of the positives is this wood frame building is an isolated building. There is no common cockloft or common roof area, so I was dealing with one one building, I didn't have exposure problems per se. The exposure on the four side or the D side is actually connected, it's one building. So I knew where the fire was, obviously heavy fire in the front, and I had plenty of resources, as you can see that in New York City, we're silly with resources, I have plenty of firefighters. I had everything but water. Water was an issue at this fire, we had frozen hydrants. So as units continued to come in, my first priority then became get water. So getting water took quite a bit of time. It took about 15 minutes, which in New York is forever, uh, but eventually we were able to get a handle on it. But again, relate those four priorities to this building, and they were all satisfied, but I still had an issue. I still had a water problem. Okay, now we'll get into the resources. We'll start winding down the presentation. Know where you're going to get your resources. Be aware of all the units on the scene. Do you have a good accountability system? Does the first arriving officer have a good accounting of where he or she has deployed the resources initially? If we have multiple units responding or multiple companies, depending on your, your particular response matrix, um, the initial incident commander, the first arriving officer, needs to be very cognizant of where they were deployed, who is doing what who's operating where in the building, because as you transfer command, the higher ranking officers arriving later, you need to account for all of these people. Knowing where the additional help is coming from and leaving access, if we're going to need a, a, an aerial device in front of the building, if it's not there yet, remember the first arriving unit has to make sure that we leave room for that unit. In some of the volunteer outfits across the country, your mutual aid comes from well from a distance, but that's certainly something you need to think about, we call that reflex time. From the time you call for the help to the time that it arrived, you've got to account for that. You've got to play uh, 